conditional expectation is a kind of partial integration. And so it turns out that all of the usual integration theory results, monotone convergence, dominated convergence, Fatou's lemma, and beyond, hold for conditional expectation just as they do for expectation appropriately. To see that, we're first going to extend conditional expectation beyond L1. When we developed the integral, we first define integrals of positive functions and then restricted to positive integrable functions and then integrable functions by taking sums of positive and negative parts. Here we're going backwards. We've defined conditional expectation for L1 functions and now we're going to back off and extend it to conditional expectations of arbitrary non-negative functions, not necessarily in L1. And here's the idea. We're just going to define it using, again, the averaging property. If x is any non-negative f measurable function and g is a sub-sigma field of f, then there is a unique, up to null sets, g measurable random variable, which we'll call for the moment x twiddle, which satisfies that the expected value of x times the indicator of b is the same as the expected value of x twiddle times the indicator of b for all g sets b. Now, from our last lecture, we proved that if x is an L1 function, this condition uniquely specifies that x twiddle is the conditional expectation. And so, since there's a unique such x tilde, we're still going to call it the conditional expectation, even if x is not necessarily an L1, but is positive, satisfying this result. Here's how this works. First, we just need to define it. To do so, we just perform an appropriate cutoff. Given any non-negative measurable x, if we take the minimum of x and n, so that when it reaches height n, it just stays there, that is, of course, L1, since we're in a probability space. And that means that we can define the conditional expectation of that L1 random variable onto the sub-sigma field G. Now, we know that conditional expectation is a monotone operation. If X is less than or equal to Y, almost surely, then the conditional expectation of X is less than or equal to the conditional expectation of Y, almost surely. And that means that since the minimum of X and N is an increasing sequence of functions as N increases, this sequence of conditional expectations is also non-decreasing as n increases. And therefore, point-wise, it has a limit, which might be infinite valued, and it's certainly not necessarily L1, but in any case, the limit, point-wise, exists. So we define the conditional expectation to be the random variable which is, point-wise, that limit. So in order to conclude the proposition, what we need to do is show that that definition satisfies this property and moreover, that this property uniquely determines the random variable x tilde. Well, let's fix a g set b and take the expected value of this conditional expectation times the indicator function of b. Of course, point-wise, this product is still the limit here times b. And since this indicator is a non-negative function, this sequence times the indicator of b is still non-decreasing. And therefore, by the regular own monotone convergence theorem, this expected value is the limit, as n goes to infinity, of the expected value of the genuine conditional expectation of x min n times the indicator of the set b. Now, this is a genuine L1 function, and so we have the averaging property for genuine conditional expectation, which tells us that inside this expectation is the same as the expectation of just x min n times the indicator of b, and now by a second application of the monotone convergence, that is equal to the expected value of x times the indicator of b. Again, just to be clear, both sides of this equation could be infinite. Point of its calculation is that if one is infinite, so is the other, and if one of them is finite, they are both the same equal finite number. So that shows that this property holds, and to be clear, the fact that this uniquely specifies x tilde up to null sets is the same proof that we've given several times.
If we take another z satisfying this on both sides, well, by using the Dinkin multiplicative systems theorem, we can extend this not just to indicator functions, but to bounded measurable functions. We can take the bounded measurable function to be z minus x tilde times a cutoff of the absolute value of that, and use the monotone convergence theorem again in order to prove the result. So that concludes this proposition. And so we now have conditional expectations of arbitrary non-negative measurable functions, not just L1 functions. One quick note, we could quickly work out that this generalized conditional expectation has many of the same properties as the genuine L1 version. The only one that we're going to need right now is the monotonicity property. If x and y are both non-negative random variables and x is less than or equal to y, almost surely, then we can take the conditional expectation of x, that is by definition, if we like, the limit as n goes to infinity of the conditional expectation of x min n. And now by the monotonicity of the conditional expectation of L1 random variables, that's less than or equal to, at each point in the limit, the conditional expectation of y min n, which again, by definition, is the conditional expectation of y. Now, with this generalization in hand so that we can make sense of conditional expectation of non-negative measurable functions, whether or not they're L1, we can state and prove the main convergence theorems for conditional expectation, that is, the monotone convergence theorem, Fatou's lemma, and the dominated convergence theorem. And here they are. Their statements are exactly the same as the statements of those classical theorems, except now they all have an almost surely at the end because, of course, the expected value when we're taking conditional expectation isn't a constant, it's a new random variable. But we can still talk about the pointwise limits almost surely of those. So the conditional monotone convergence theorem says that if xn is a non-decreasing, almost surely, sequence of measurable random variables, then the conditional expectation of the limit is equal to the limit of the conditional expectations conditioned on any sigma field, almost surely. The conditional Fatou's lemma says that if I have any sequence of non-negative random variables, then the conditional expectation given g of the liminf of those random variables is almost surely less than or equal to the liminf of the conditional expectation of them. And most importantly, the conditional dominated convergence theorem states that if xn is a sequence of random variables that are L1 this time, and they converge almost surely to a random variable x, which is also an L1. If all of the random variables xn are dominated by a fixed L1 function y, almost surely, then the conditional expectation of xn converges almost surely and in L1 to the conditional expectation of the limit x. Let's prove these one by one. First, for the monotone convergence theorem, we note that since the conditional expectation, as we noted on the last slide, is monotone, since the xn's are a non-decreasing sequence, the conditional expectations will also be a non-decreasing sequence of random variables. Now let's fix a g set b, and now we can apply the standard monotone convergence theorem to this sequence of random variables here. That sequence is non-decreasing since the indicator function of b is a non-negative function. And therefore, by the standard monotone convergence theorem, the expected value of this limit is the limit of those expected values. Now, by the averaging property that defines the conditional expectation inside that limit, we have the expected value of just xn times the indicator of b. And now we can apply the standard monotone convergence theorem again, since xn times b is still a non-decreasing sequence. And so that is the same as the expected value of the limit, as n goes to infinity of xn times the indicator of b. And now using the averaging property one more time, the expected value of this general random variable times the indicator of a g set b can be evaluated as the expected value of the conditional expectation given g of that limit random variable times the indicator of b. And so we've shown that for any g set b, the expected value of 1b times this is the same as the expected value of 1b times this. That uniquely specifies that these two random variables are equal almost surely, which is what we hoped to show. Next, the conditional Fatou's lemma 
For each fixed k, we let yk denote the infimum of the xn for n past k. Then, by definition, yk is less than or equal to xk, because xk is in this sequence that we're taking the infimum of. But also, since as k increases, we're taking an infimum of fewer and fewer terms, the sequence yk is a non-decreasing sequence. And so we'll just apply the conditional monotone convergence theorem that we just proved to the sequence yk. That will tell us that the conditional expectation of the limit of the xn's, which is by definition the limit of the yk's, is going to be equal to, by the conditional monotone convergence theorem, the limit as k goes to infinity of the conditional expectation given g of yk. Now, this is a genuine limit because this is an increasing sequence, but any genuine limit can also be written as a limit, so we may as well write it like this. And the reason to do so is to now note that since yk is less than or equal to xk and the conditional expectation is monotone, this will be less than or equal to, term by term, the conditional expectation of yk, and the limit will respect that. So we'll get that this is less than or equal to the limit of the conditional expectation of xk, and that is indeed conditional Fatou's lemma. That brings us to the conditional dominated convergence theorem, which actually has two statements. If xn converges to x almost surely, and we have our uniform dominator, then the conditional expectation of xn converges to the conditional expectation of x both in L1 and almost surely. So for the L1 statement, actually, we don't need anything fancy. By the usual dominated convergence theorem, xn will converge to x in L1 in the presence of this dominator. But that means that if we take the L1 distance between the conditional expectation of xn and the conditional expectation of x, well, by the linearity of conditional expectation, that's the L1 norm of the conditional expectation of xn minus x. And the conditional expectation is an L1 contraction. That's less than or equal to the L1 norm of xn minus x, which we just showed goes to zero. So that shows the L1 convergence as stated. Now we'd like to also show almost sure convergence, and we're going to follow the usual proof of the dominated convergence using Fatou's lemma in order to do this, except we'll use the conditional Fatou's lemma. So because y dominates the absolute value of xn, that means that the random variables y plus xn and y minus xn are both non-negative. Therefore, we can apply conditional Fatou to show that if I take y plus or minus x, which by the almost sure convergence assumption on xn is the same thing as the limit of y plus or minus xn, which is the same thing as the limit of y plus or minus xn. That's the conditional expectation of a limit of non-negative functions. And so by conditional Fatou's lemma, that is less than or equal to the limit of the conditional expectation of y plus or minus xn. Now this is two statements in one, so let's consider the two statements separately. In the plus case, we can use the linearity of the conditional expectation, which is valid here. We're all in the L1 case now. And write that as the conditional expectation of y plus the limit of the conditional expectation of xn. In the negative case, on the other hand, we can write this as the conditional expectation of y plus the limit of the conditional expectation of minus xn. And we can pull that minus sign out here, and we can also pull it out here. But if we take a negative sign out of a liminf, that turns it into a lim soup. Now on the other hand, by linearity of conditional expectation, this is just equal to the conditional expectation of y plus or minus the conditional expectation of x. And so putting these things together with the inequality, that tells us that the conditional expectation of x is less than or equal to the lim inf, and a negative of it is less than or equal to the negative of the lim soup, which, by the way that inequalities work, tells us that the lim soup of the conditional expectation of xn is less than or equal to the conditional expectation of x, is less than or equal to the lim inf of the conditional expectation of xn. But of course, the lim inf 
is less than or equal to the lima soup. And so that tells us that this chain of inequalities are actually all equalities. And since the lima soup is equal to the limit, that means it's equal to the limit, which therefore allows us to conclude that the conditional expectation of x is almost surely equal to the limit of the conditional expectation of xn, concluding the second statement of the conditional dominated convergence theorem. Now, we could go into all sorts of other limit theorems and inequalities. For example, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, Holder's inequality, Markov and Chebyshev inequalities, and you can see how to modify all of them in order to have conditional forms. I'm not going to go through them now. I am going to look at one other integral inequality, which is very important in the regular non-conditional expectation case, but we skipped until now. We're going to prove the conditional version, which of course includes the regular version as a special case, and that is Jensen's inequality. Jensen's inequality says that the expected value of a convex function of an L1 random variable can only be larger than the convex function of the expected value. And we're going to state and prove the conditional form of that, which is right here. We start with an L1 random variable and a sub sigma field G of the sigma field on which it's measurable and a convex function of a single variable. If we've chosen that convex function such that the composition phi of x is still L1, then it turns out that that same function phi of the conditional expectation is also L1, now of the sub sigma field. And phi of the conditional expectation is almost surely less than or equal to the conditional expectation of phi of the random variable. And given the fact that both sides of this equation are in L1 as part of the theorem, it follows that by taking expectation of both sides, the expected value of phi of the conditional expectation of x is less than or equal to the expected value of this, but we know that the expected value of the conditional expectation of an L1 random variable is the same as just the expected value of that random variable. So that's the conditional Jensen inequality, and we're going to basically prove it right now. In order to sweep some of the less appealing technical details under the rug, I'm going to make the simplifying assumption that we will apply this only to strictly convex C2 functions, phi. That is not absolutely necessary. This same proof technique actually works for all convex functions, which are not necessarily C2 or even C1, but are almost everywhere differentiable. We can use the same proof we're doing here by replacing derivatives with left derivatives and being careful. And if you'd like to see all of those details spelled out, I recommend you look in the relevant sections of driver's notes. But we are going to assume that phi is C2 and that its second derivative is strictly positive, which is largely true for convex functions. Now, in that case, the difference quotient phi of y minus phi of x over y minus x with, say, y bigger than x is always greater than or equal to the derivative at the lower point x. Now, to see that, you could apply the mean value theorem, which tells us that there will be some point in between x and y where the derivative at that curve is equal to the slope of that secant line. And since phi double prime is strictly positive, that means phi prime is an increasing function, which means its value had to be smaller here in order to get to that value further along. This inequality will be reversed with x bigger than y, but if we multiply through by y minus x and note that its sign changes there as well, what that means is that for all x and y, phi of y minus phi of x will be greater than or equal to phi prime of x times y minus x. Now, using that basic calculus inequality here, let's substitute in our random variable, capital X, for this variable y. That will tell us that for any real number, little x, phi of capital X, this random variable, is almost surely greater than or equal to this affine function of x. Now we use monotonicity of the conditional expectation. Conditional expectation of phi of x be greater than or equal to, well, these parts are constants, so their conditional expectation is themselves, and conditional expectation is linear, so we can move it inside to get this. 
Now that's true for each x. What we'd like to do is to now take the supremum over x. Of course, since this is true for all real numbers, little x here, this is greater than or equal to all of those, it will be greater than or equal to the supremum over little x of that. The problem with that is that this is only an almost sure statement, and if I take a supremum over an uncountable set, all hell will break loose. So what we'll do is we'll restrict our attention here and say, well, this is certainly true for all rational numbers, x. That's a countable set, and therefore we can conclude that on a set of full measure, the conditional expectation of 5 capital X is greater than or equal to the supremum over all rational numbers, q, of that quantity inside. with probability one. Now fortunately, under the assumptions that we've made about phi, we can compute what this supremum actually is. Getting rid of the random variable x for the moment, if I take the supremum over all rational numbers x of this quantity here with the other real number y in there again, that supremum over rationals is just going to equal phi at that value y. So why is that? Well, first, under the assumption that phi was c2, that means that both phi and phi prime are continuous functions, and so we can again convert this back into a supremum over all real numbers of the same. And now we'll use calculus. This supremum is going to be achieved at a critical point of this function of x. So let's differentiate the derivative of that function of x for fixed y is phi prime at x plus phi double prime at x times y minus x plus phi prime at x times minus 1. Those two terms cancel. And we get that there's a unique critical point under our assumption that phi double prime is strictly positive and that unique critical point is where x equals y, and so that shows us that the supremum is phi of y. Now don't worry about the fact that we used the differentiability of phi prime in this argument. In fact, this statement is true for any convex function phi, and you can see section 17 of driver's notes in order for a more careful argument that shows that that's true in general. Okay, so what that means is, as we showed on the last slide, the conditional expectation of 5x is greater than or equal to this supremum over all x's, and we just showed that that supremum with a y there is equal to 5y, so that's equal to phi of the conditional expectation of x. And that's the first statement that we wanted to show for Jensen's inequality. Conditional expectation of 5x is greater than or equal to 5 conditional expectation of x. Now the second statement was that in fact this is an L1 function. We can't tell that just from here because while well, this is L1, phi of it need not be a prior i. All we know is that this inside here is L1. So that means that we do have an upper bound that is an L1 function by the L1 contractivity of the conditional expectation, but this is not a positive function. This could in principle blow up below and be something that is not L1 after we take the absolute value. That's why we still have to work a little bit so in order to get that lower bound, remember that calculus inequality that we saw, that phi of y is greater than or equal to 5x plus phi prime of x times y minus x for all numbers x and y. And now if we substitute in instead of x, the conditional expectation of x for the variable y, that tells us this. That's true for any x. And so what that means is that taking absolute values the absolute value of 5, the conditional expectation, is upper bounded by whichever is bigger, the absolute value of the conditional expectation of 5x, or the absolute value of this. Now that's true for any x, so we could take an infimum over x if we want, but the point is that for any given x, this is L1, since this is an L1 random variable and we're just taking some affine function of it. Therefore, we can conclude, since this is L1 and this is L1, that therefore this is L1, 
And that finishes the proof of the conditional Jensen inequality. Let's conclude this lecture by briefly using the conditional Jensen inequality to prove a nice generalization of the L1 contractivity of conditional expectation. Remember, we started by defining conditional expectation in the L2 setting as orthogonal projection. And orthogonal projection shrinks L2 norm, so we already knew it was an L2 contraction, and then we extended it to L1 by showing that it's also an L1 contraction. Well, it turns out that it's also an LP contraction for every P. Remember that LP is contained in L1 of a probability space, so it makes sense to take conditional expectation of an LP random variable. And the result is that the LP norm of the conditional expectation of X is less than or equal to the LP norm of X for every P. To see that, we just use the conditional Jensen inequality with the convex function phi of X is equal to absolute value of X to the P, which is convex. In fact, it's even C2 for a large enough P, but let's not worry about that. Jensen's inequality says that if phi P of X is L1, which means that x to the p in absolute value is l1, i.e. that x is in lp, then phi of the conditional expectation of x is less than or equal to the conditional expectation of phi of x. So this is the absolute value of the conditional expectation to the pth power, and this is the conditional expectation of the pth power absolute value. So we get that this is less than or equal to this, almost surely. And since both sides are in L1, we therefore can take expected values of both sides, but the right-hand side expected value is just the expected value of x to the p, and that by taking pth roots shows us that the conditional expectation of x has LP norm less than or equal to the LP norm of x, concluding the proof.